We've got two young children and one of the things that we occasionally like to do together is a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, not one of those enormous sort of thousand piece jigsaws or one of those impossi puzzles which really do look impossible because everything looks the same. Uh, but simple children's jigsaws and it can be hilarious or it can be frustrating depending on your perspective to watch small children try and do a jigsaw. Um, sometimes uh, they get the right piece to the right place but they just can't quite fit it together the right way in order for the jigsaw to be completed. At other times they're way off the mark you know, you say turn it around as a parent trying to help them, but rather than turning it clockwise, which is what you were thinking, they flip it over so you get the back of the jigsaw instead. And you're just kind of thinking, oh no. At other times you say, well, we'll try that piece, thinking that they'll pick up that piece and put it where they were just looking, but then they try and put it somewhere else altogether. As a parent, you have to be so patient and you have to resist the temptation just to, to go and do it for them. In the Bible, John's Gospel tells us all about the life of Jesus and it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. There are different pieces called signs that help us to grasp who Jesus is and we have to put it together for ourselves. The first sign, the first jigsaw piece is Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana. It's a sign that speaks of, of Jesus' incredible generosity and abundance. The kingdom of God is not somewhere that's stingy. You know, God's goodness will keep on flowing just like the wine did at that wedding. Another sign is quite similar. That's the feeding of the 5,000 where Jesus takes a little boy's packed lunch and he multiplies it so that it feeds 5,000 people or more. And that reminds us, doesn't it, that, that God can take what we have in our weakness and he can use it to do amazing things. There's the sign of Jesus walking on water, where we're reminded of the power of Jesus Christ. He has power over this world, this created world. He has the power to, to fulfil the promises that he's made. Three of the signs are about physical healings. Jesus transforms the lives of a, a royal official's son, a paralytic and a blind man. And we see that Jesus wants to restore our brokenness. That's what the kingdom of God is about. There's no sickness, there's no pain, there's no death, there's no tears in the kingdom of God. What a hope that offers us. And the seventh sign, the seventh jigsaw piece goes even further because... It's not just healing somebody physically, it's actually raising somebody from death itself. You know, Jesus brings his friend Lazarus back to life again and we realise that even death is not beyond Jesus' ability. There is nothing beyond his reach. And when we see all of these signs, all of these jigsaw pieces, we have to put them together. What do we see? Well, we see that in Jesus Christ, God has come to us. We see the phenomenal love of God. We see that God is so incredibly for us and not against us. God wants us to flourish as human beings. We see that in Jesus, God is creating a new world. You know, the seven signs perhaps are a bit like the seven days of creation at the start of the Bible. God is making a new creation, a new world, a new kingdom where all of the mess, all of the brokenness, all of the sin of this world will be no more. But there's one final piece to the jigsaw that brings together, that connects up all of the other pieces. Maybe it's the big piece in the centre of the puzzle. And it's what we remember today. That in Jesus Christ, God has laid down his life for us. You've been in the church a while those words might have lost some of their power. So let me say it again. In Jesus Christ, God has laid down his life for us. God has laid down his life for you. God has suffered for you. In this single act of sacrifice, we see the remarkable generosity and abundance of God. Only it's not wine that's now flowing freely. It's Jesus' blood that covers a multitude of sins, the sins of, of humankind in every time and every place. It's not the generosity of God in, in bread physically multiplying to feed 5,000 people. It's Jesus, the bread of life, coming to nourish us, to give us what we need so deeply in our souls. A relationship with God. A life 
with our Father who made us and who loves us. We see without doubt God's incredible desire to bring us healing and restoration. By his stripes you are healed. But we see not just physical healing, but spiritual healing, that our sin can be forgiven. Everything that we've done that separates us from God, everything that we're ashamed of, Jesus has paid the price for us. Jesus has, has, been the pen, has taken the penalty that was ours. He has died in our place that we might go free, that we might be forgiven, that we might be able to live a, a free and redeemed and rescued life in the here and the now. The cross of Jesus is, is utterly beautiful and stunning. It means so much to us. It is absolutely the heart of our faith. It's why the cross is the symbol of Christianity. And so each one of us today needs to take a fresh look at this jigsaw piece, at this puzzle, at this picture that we have of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I really urge you to, to take a look at it, to read the Gospels, to talk to Christians, because this is the most remarkable gift you could ever receive. And Jesus is giving it to you freely. It's not about being a good person. It's not about um, ticking lots of religious boxes and doing what you might think are the right things. It's about receiving the grace of Jesus and letting that grace change you, letting it change you to the point that you live a new life, a radically different life here and now that carries us into eternity. If like me, you've been in the church for quite a long time, I also want to urge you to look for afresh at that picture today, at that jigsaw puzzle. Because what Rotherham needs, what our town needs, is a church that is on fire for Jesus Christ. What our town needs is a church that is so in love with Jesus that we will go to remarkable lengths to show that love and to live that love amongst the people around us who don't yet know Jesus. We need to be lost in the words of the old hymn, in wonder, love and praise, because that is what will make us distinctive. That is what will make us different. The grace of God working in our hearts and renewing our minds that we become new people, that we become lights in the darkness, that we would be prepared to give our all for Jesus and his kingdom just as he has given his all for us. We need, we need to look afresh at the cross. We need to be transformed by the cross. We need to become cross-shaped people. We need to become people who are like Jesus, his hands and his feet. Loving others and loving God more than we love our own comfort and our own happiness and our own satisfaction. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time praying. Um, we're going to pray that we would have a fresh revelation of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So let's pray and we'll begin with a time of silence and then I'm going to use some words of Malcolm Duncan and then I'll lead us in prayer. Amidst the busyness of life, may your striving be stilled by the suffering of the Saviour. May the voices that clamour for your attention and demand your focus be silenced by the voice from the cross. The voice that cries, Father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. May the uncertainty of your circumstances be reframed by the certainty of the grace of God who loves you and who gave himself for you. King Jesus, we stand amazed when we realise what you have done for each one of us. 
when we see your amazing grace, when we see your boundless love, when we see the lengths to which you went to sacrifice yourself, that we might be free, that we might be forgiven, that we might receive a new life, a life with God, a life as your disciples, a life empowered by your Holy Spirit. King Jesus, we thank you that you have brought in a new kingdom, a kingdom that is growing in our hearts and our lives. Help us. Help us to follow your example and pick up our crosses and follow you. Help us to love to love God enough that we would say and pray as you did, not my will, Father, but yours be done. That we wouldn't live just for our own comfort. We wouldn't just live for our own happiness and fulfilment, but that we would live for your eternal kingdom. That we would be focused on who you've called us to be and what you're calling us to do. We're so sorry for the times that we've let you down. We're so sorry for the times when instead of being a church full of fire and power and love, we've been lukewarm and we've been weak and we've been ineffective. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. Pour out your Holy Spirit now. And help us to receive all that you want us to give all that you want us to have. Come Lord Jesus, come Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we sing our next song, we've got a testimony to encourage us from Lou, who's part of the church family at Herringthorpe URC. So it's my anniversary this week, and you might be thinking, great, how long have you been married? That's not the anniversary I'm actually talking about. Six years ago this week, February 21st, I legally changed my first name. Now you might be thinking, why? So my story goes like this. When I was growing up, I wasn't a great person. I wasn't the best Christian, I was actually living a double life, so I was a Christian on a Sunday, or I was just a Christian when I felt like it, and the other times I didn't treat people particularly well. You might find a few people to talk to about that one, but God one day challenged me really, really strongly, and he said, you can't do this anymore, you need to change, and you need to either be a Christian or not. And I really wanted to stay as a Christian, but I didn't want to continue the double life that I was living. When I was 18, I went to do a gap year in Northern Ireland and I felt that God was saying to me, Saul in the Bible used to be a really rubbish person, let's face it. Um, and one day he changed and he needed to know that he was a new person and people needed to know that he was a different person as well. And so God challenged him to change his name which is what happened. God changed his name. Now, growing up, I used to adopt the nickname Lou because I just felt like I needed that identity. All my other friends were able to change, you know, their their real name and shorten it down. So I had a friend called Danielle and we called her Danny um, and so on. And, and I really felt like I needed a nickname as well. And so growing up, I was called Lou quite a lot, but, but quite often that was just for the people that really wanted to. Um, it, it wasn't something that everybody did. So when I moved to Northern Ireland, God challenged me and said, if you want to feel like you've really changed, then use that name going forward and you can have that new identity. You can be changed. And that's what I did. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect in any way. And after a year, I got back from Ireland and 
and some of the old stuff did come back in. I wasn't always a great person. I'm still not always perfect. Nobody is perfect, unfortunately. But I felt different because I'd got that new name and, and it was really difficult for, for some people to accept that was what I wanted to be called full time. So fast forward on quite a lot of time to six years ago, so 2016. Um, Gareth and I had been married a couple of years, so our wedding service actually contained my real legal name back in the day. Um, I don't actually use that name, obviously, and I, I don't really tell it to people because some people think, oh, I'll just call you that. Well, that's not okay for me, is it? Because actually that is a that is a dead name to me. It's not something I associate with myself. You know, can you imagine Saul changing to Paul and people calling him Saul and he would just associate that with all the negative stuff that he'd done in his life? And that's how I feel. You know, if people call me that, then it makes me, it takes me back a long time to, to who I used to be. Um, and it doesn't feel great. Which leads me on to my next point. Recently, I've been thinking about the past and, and the things that, I, the mistakes I had made. And I've recently realised that God forgave me a long time ago, which is amazing, isn't it? God forgives us for the things that we do wrong. But I hadn't forgiven myself which is ridiculous in some ways. But God sent his son Jesus to earth to die on a cross so that we can be forgiven, us mere mortals can be forgiven. But we don't forgive ourselves. We don't accept that forgiveness fully. And I've been carrying around a little bit of guilt from the last however many years. And that's just silly, you know. God has had the grace to forgive me for the mistakes I have made. He's changed my name. He's given me this new identity. And I've tried my best most of the time to live up to that and to be a great person. And I hope I do justice to that. But as, at the same time, I need to forgive myself for the things that I've done wrong, just like God has forgiven us. And today I just want to encourage you and challenge you to, to forgive yourself because God has already forgiven us. So you don't need to hold a grudge against yourself anymore. Accept God's mercy and take that forgiveness and forgive yourself. Love yourself enough to move on from the past. There's a song by Blue Tree and if you've seen any of my other reflections, you'll know I really like Blue Tree at the minute. Um, it does take me back to my gap here in Northern Ireland because that's when I first... Um, heard of them and, and fell in love with them then and recently that's just the band that I really like worshipping with um, and one of their songs is Greater Things Are Yet To Come and I just think if we forgive ourselves and we accept God's love and God's mercy then greater things will happen to us there's no point in being bogged down and hindered by the past when God said it's done it's finished, just let it go you know let it go and forgive yourself and love yourself enough to let that past go so that you can move forward in what God is saying to you and asking of you. And so we can have that perfect relationship with God.